Thank you very much, everybody, and welcome to the second of today's presentations. Uh, before we go any further, those that don't know me, I'm Rob Copley. I'm the chairman of the Farm Retail Association. Uh, I also run Farmer Copley's Farm Shop. We're a farm shop, cafe, event centre, weddings functions, or we was weddings functions. We're not doing any of them at the moment. Pumpkin Festival. Uh, we have a turnover of over £4 million, pounds, up to 70 staff. Uh, on to this session, we've got 28% against turnover wages in the cafe and 13% in the shop. Uh, we make a profit of well over 10% net profits, even this year during COVID. And I know we have a lot of members on at the moment, but we've also opened this up to non-members and openly admit this is a recruitment exercise to get more people to join the FRA. Uh, reasons for you to join the FRA is you will make more profit by, be discu by discussing with people what you do and what they do and uh, it will stop you making mistakes because most of us have been there and done it and we've all got something to learn and it is a really good sharing and caring organisation. There's also lots of benefits to being a member. There's the Facebook forum where you can open the discuss stuff. Andrew's often on there helping people with planning permission or He's the go-to guru at the moment for what we can and can't do under restrictions. And there's also benefits like payment sense, card payments. Uh, I'm not saying it's always the cheapest, but it's a really good baseline to go to. Go get your price off of payment sense and then go beat up everybody else. And, uh, you know, usually payment sense wins, but at least you know you're about right on that. There's also the Booker rebate, which a lot of people don't realise. This alone will save you its membership. I mean, we buy lots of alcohol and coke and sugar and salt. Uh, my rebate from Booker last year was just short of £2,000. And you also get to meet lots of friends. Uh, friends that you can speak closely with. And the more you get to know them, the more you open up and say, you know, how are you doing about your turnover? What's, what's your costs in that? What are you spending on electric? How are you doing that? How is that so cheap? So... Number one to join is it will make you money. And we also bring you things like this. I'm going to hand it over to Andrew in a minute. It's uh, from Malcolm Scott. He's going to talk to us how to maximise turnover. He's going to be setting us some targets. Who's who? I don't even know what you're going to say, Andrew. I know roughly what you're going to talk about. <laughs> uh, and help us understand our staffing costs. So I think I'll welcome Andrew at that point. Thank you. Thanks. I think the first thing I'll do is try and share my screen just to get me off it. Give me two seconds. How's that? Is that up there, Jenny? Oh, hello. Sorry, I um, think you can hear me. Yeah, we can see that. Thanks very much. Fantastic, thank you. So uh, first thing, just like to say hello to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, just following on from the last, sorry, this presentation is just, I've got to emphasize it is a whistle stop tour of commercial realities. There's an awful lot of subjects we're going to touch on. So uh, if I don't give enough detail to anybody, there will be chance for questions at the end. Um, and obviously we've got an open forum, so someone can contact us over the next week or so if they wanted to as well. But um, yeah, we're just going to try and touch on as many little realities as possible. Um, and where possible, I'm going to try and re reference it to the Farm Retail Association because um, there's an awful lot of stuff we can help each other with. Uh, one of the things that I was going to touch on was people and that the team achieves more. Anybody who listened to Malcolm's presentation uh, earlier, one of the things I'd suggest you do if you didn't was to listen to it. It was fantastic. And it was all about team. Uh, and for me, your team are the most important commercial aspect you've got um, or resource. So if you get your team right, they will, um, if I'm sure, I haven't gone into this in too much detail, but they will be really important for you delivering everything we're about to go through in a second. So the other thing Malcolm was very good at was Japanese. He talked an awful lot of Japanese things. And funnily enough, one of the things, oops, sorry, my screen's not moving. There you go. One of the things that I brought up next is a Japanese symbol. I, I live by something called Kaizen, something I've, I've been really into for a number of years now, and it's about continuous improvement. So it's about step, not, not making big steps and standardizing it. It's about making lots of little steps and improving all of the time. So I think just from Malcolm's point of view, more than anything else, I had to put something Japanese in there just so I was up with him. 
the continuous improvement is really good. And it's something that when we relate to commercialism, we should never sit on our laurels. We should be ready to move forward for the next little step. I guess the one for me regarding all the things we're going to go through, um, turnover is vanity. It's great to have a, I've sat in a 40 million pound business before, losing a million pound a year. It, you know, it, it's one of those that you, turnover is vanity and profit is sanity. And I always put cash is king. So whilst it's important to spend time on building your brand and generating as much money as possible, um, it's really vital to ensure you've got a steady, a steady amount of income coming into the farm shop just to cover all of your expenses, as we all know, especially in the current climate, which is easier said than done. So maximizing farm shop, as I said, I mean, the, the key for me is to just go through my 10 points, I guess, of um, maximizing or looking at commerciality through a farm shop. And the first point of this is maximizing your turnover. So just touching on that. November, I think, is going to be huge. Malcolm commented a lot about December being big. November is going to be massive. There's nowhere else for anyone to shop. We've got one competition out there, which is garden centres. Um, and they're either going to be supportive and we're going to work very close together, be in rural businesses, or they are just ahead on competition. Depends how you look at it in your own business. But they're the only place that people can visit really for their gift and their Christmas on top of us other than the internet. So um, I've got a feeling that we talk about, I know it's a real downside with cafes being shut, but I've got a feeling November could be a booming month for you, especially the last two weeks of November. And it's whether you're gonna be ready for that massive surge. We've seen it on the high street now. Um, you know, we're based in the middle of Worcester, so we're in the middle of the city center. And I went out yesterday and it took me half an hour to get served in one shop. Uh, just because of the numbers of people. Well, those people have got to go somewhere in the next couple of weeks, and I've got a feeling we may get hit with it. There's me trying to be over positive. So I spoke to uh, a gent who worked for Data Strategy Consulting Limited called Duncan Syme, um, and I just wanted to pick his brain over turnover. And he said that there are three core ways that revenue can grow. The first one is to sell and to have customers. We know that. The next one is to sell more and increase average basket spend, which is something that some people do very well and we don't always in others. So I'm gonna to touch on that a bit later on. And the other one is to sell more often and get more frequent visitors. So again, that comes down to how can we increase people from visiting once a month or five times a year to probably once a week. We'll touch on some of these later on. I guess the first thing that I wanted to challenge everybody with was, do you know your proposition? When I first got involved in the farm shop market a number of years ago, um, I couldn't get my head around why I would visit a farm shop. Now, I'll put it into context. The farm shops around me were, I wouldn't say they were destination sites. And I'm going back a number of years. We've developed no end in our business. But lots of places i couldn't get my head around why i would go there instead of you know my local waitrose for good quality veg or if i wanted convenience actually out of tesco's around the corner and an aldi um and the more i got involved the more i realized that farm shops needed a clear proposition so and it's built around what i call the six p's and it's a it's a common retail concept or marketing concept depending on which way you look at it but just going through them, you know, product. Product is one of the most important elements of retail mix. Retailers need to identify and fulfill their customer needs. Um, retailers have got to be focused on the range and the quality of the product to meet your customer expectations. So if you're trying to put things in front of the customer that you don't think is going to work, don't go somewhere else. Um, price, price plays an important part. Um, are you, you know, how are you establishing yourself? Are you trying to fight the Aldis out there or are you trying to put yourself in a different price bracket and look for a different target market? So it depends on what you think your proposition is. Um, place is the right location where customers can access the product. So really it's about flow and it's about adjacencies, which I'll touch on later on when we talk about link selling. 
you know, do the customer walk into veg, which very often happens in our farm shop, or in some farm shops, the veg is right at the end of the journey so that it doesn't get crushed under all the heavy goods. It's, it's a personal opinion, but as a proposition, you need to decide what's right for you and what's right for the customer. Um, people, Malcolm went into detail on this, um, and it is about making sure that you've got the right mix of people and they've got the right passion and skill and attitude and service to actually deliver what you see as your, your brand, I guess. Um, presentation goes to the physical environment and farm shop, whether it's the signage at the front, it could be a website, uh, it could be the cleanliness of the site. And then obviously when you come into the farm shop, it's about how you lay everything out, how neat it is, how easy it is to shop. Is it all priced? Um, it, these propositions are all about putting yourself in the customer's shoes. And the minute you stop thinking about the customer and you think about what you want, you'll start, you get yourself on a slippery slope there. It really is about working with them. Um, and the last one is promotion. Uh, promotion tool used by farm shops to tell people what you do. Now, social media we'll touch on later on, um, but there's an awful lot that farm shops have to offer. And it's done through various di different methods, whether it be signage or marketing, newspaper adverts, leaflets, but as we know, um, social media and data is, is the real market, is the real way to market right now and cost effective. So question I've got for everyone is, can you standardize a farm shop? So I've consulted on farm shops and garden centers for a long time. And there's a, farm shops are, in my view, in a unique situation with themselves. So I'm gonna give you, just pop up one slide that's got four examples of farm shops, because my honest view is, you can't standardize a farm shop. I couldn't just drop a 400 square meter farm shop in the middle of a field and say, you need 40 meters to this and you need 200 meters to that. Um, it, it's all down on the, the, on the farm shop itself and what its brand is. So here's four farm shops that we work with. Now I've highlighted in yellow where they get most of their trade from. So farm shop number one, has uh, a good steady butchery and deli counter and a nice cafe. Farm shop number two, really, really strong in butchery. It's all about the beef. That's what it's all about. Uh, and they've got a good following cafe that's very much led by lunches there more than anything else. Um, farm shop number three is fruit and veg without a cafe. This is this is actually a very local farm shop to me, and it's all about convenience food um and price for them but um you know they've got a smallish butchery counter with a little bit of cheese on the side um but it's all about fruit and veg for them and grocery uh it's a, it's kind of your local shop and farm shop number four massive cafe um not very much retail and you pick up a few groceries on the way out whether you question that as a farm shop is for is for the individual visiting um but it just shows that if I try to work out a template from all of this, I couldn't tell you what the best product mix is. We could work on margins and I could tell you what work, but these guys are all working around their proposition and their brand. So, you know, when you look at farm shop number two, they are shouting, we are, we are the best at beef in the area. When you look at proposition number four, they're saying, we'll give you the best restaurant visit in my area. There's a nice little shop for you to pick up some stuff on the way out. Um, and you need to decide, I guess, as a farm shop, what do you believe in and what you're famous for? You know, what is it that makes a difference? Malcolm in the first session talked about um, the experience that you get from a farm shop. Well, one challenge I'd give anybody listening to this is to say to yourself, why do people visit your farm shop? Why? Do they come to you instead of going to a local competitor? Now, you probably know that, and I might be teaching granny to suck eggs here, but it's just something that always sticks out to me that you've got to have a real definition of what you're doing and what your brand is. So, you know, is your brand about quality? Is it about value? Is it about convenience? Is it about the whole experience? You just need to know it. And sometimes working with other members of the FRA, you help you identify that. 
um, and the networking that goes on and the sharing of things really work well. So defining your retail strategy from a commercial aspect, um, I've just put it into a little box. Now you can do these in different orders, but I'm just gonna go through them. So firstly, you need to identify your target market. You know, if, if, what's the affluence? What's the age group? Who are you gonna to sell to? Um, next thing is obviously to know your competition. Last thing you wanna do is take someone on head on unless you're better than them. Um, but you need to know your competition inside out and how flexible they are to diversify as well. The, the benefit we get as independents is we can always adapt our offer. Whereas if you're then taking on, I don't know, a Waitrose or a co-op or even an Aldi or someone, they're very set in the ways because they run from a head office and it's not about community. So, um, you know, they struggle with us a little bit. You then need to define your proposition. So just going back to what we talked about, know why you are doing what you're doing, know your brand and know what, what you're all about. And then you've got to determine your core benefits and brand proposition. So it really is about making sure that you emphasize them and the customer understands what you're about. Next step after that is to decide on ta tactics. Um, I'll touch on KPIs and smart objectives later on but it's just knowing what you're gonna to do to tackle the customers and challenge their brain and make them realize they want to come to you rather than somebody else. Um, and then the basic bit at the end is to set a budget around what you want and timelines and it helps you set objectives going forward. That budget is where the commercial aspects come in. So first step, I guess, for turnover is, first thing I'd say is do the basics well. Meet the customer's expectations. Uh, make sure the facilities are right. You know, and I don't mean the lose there, <laughs> although the lose are included in this. You know, it's making sure that you've got um, shopping trolleys. So I have a big thing when I visit farm shops, they haven't all got shopping trolleys, and yet we've got an older customer who struggles to carry things. Um, and whenever I walk into a farm shop with a shopping trolley, I do a little skip. But it's, um, yeah, if little things please me like that. But it's it's really important we give everybody what they need. You know, at the moment, it's the hand gels and it's the cleanliness and the queue management. But it's all really important that you do those basics well. Get your layout and your flow right. I think since I've joined the FRA, the biggest challenge I've had from FRA members is how do I get my circular flow right? How do I get everybody to walk past everything? Um, COVID's actually probably helped that because customers are used to the old IKEA system, one-way system, walking past everything. But it's a big, big challenge. And it's been interesting that so how many people, uh, how many businesses across the whole country, not just farm shops, don't get the layout and flow right. Um, and make it easy for the customer to shop. Next thing is merchandising. I believe Judy sat on the, um, on, on the session today. Um, so there's... Judy did a presentation on merchandising. Uh, it's something that is really key to us in an industry. And how does it help commerciality? It's just the ease of shopping, it's clarity, it's availability of product. Uh, it's making sure everything's priced. It's making sure everything's clean. It's giving, it's giving customers a reason, or rather not giving the customers a reason not to shop. If they can see everything and they can see it's priced and it's clear, well merchandised and appetizing, then they're gonna to come to you. Be seasonal. Um, you know, we've got farm shops near us and um, they're not, they, they, they don't always put things out. I was working with a farm shop um, in uh, Worcestershire, uh, we still are, and they asked how much space they needed for a pumpkin event. And I came out with a fair few hundred square meters based on sales potential. And they said, oh, well, I wanna run a pumpkin event from 30 square meters. And we talked about the benefits and negatives of them turning it into an event. Um, however, if you then go into other areas, you know, we know we've got seasons of all different fruits. I don't think your customer base understands the season of veg and fruit. And I think there's a real opportunity for us in farm shops to make the most of that, commercialize it and tell people to come to you because it's unique. I guess the big thing about seasonal, sorry, going back a slide, is um, it's your USP as well. It really is one of the standout things where people, where the high street and the supermarkets don't focus and it 
creates return visits more often. So that's a big one. So average transaction is essential. Just going back to one of Duncan's points, which is we've got to increase the average transaction values. I call it perfect partners. Um, and it's an easy thing and I appreciate, again, I'm probably teaching granny to suck eggs from your angle, but it's one of those things that help people to um, upsell. Now, upselling can be seen as a negative for many staff. However, the thing I'd encourage any staff to do is if you give somebody an extra product, sometimes it, in, it I suppose it heightens their experience. So if somebody comes to a butchery counter and they want a joint of beef for their Sunday lunch, sell them some horseradish. You know, for me, I'd either have horseradish, if I didn't have horseradish on my Sunday lunch, I'd be missing out. But actually, there's a link sale there or a perfect partner to send and how you want to do it. You know, we look at pancake day, merchandise together. You know, on there, we're missing the pans. We've got the whisks, we've got the eggs, we've got the lemons. You know, where's your, we, we need to add um, cookery books. All these things are little link sales that make a difference. I was at um, I was at a farm shop just visiting them, and they were they were one of our award winners last year, and that's the reason I visited them. And I saw a coffee display, and I stood there thinking, do you know it's great because they've got cafetiers right next to it. And I'm coming into Christmas, I'm thinking commercially, I'm going in to buy a cafetiere, and actually I'm going to walk out with a coffee. Or vice versa, you walk into a farm shop for food and you think, oh, I've got this fantastic, unique coffee. What can I serve it in? Oh, coincidentally, there's a small cafetiere for £12 next to it. It's easy money if it's done right. It's got to be done right and it can't be overdone. But it is easy money for you and it's really a, a good commercial angle. But Perfect Partners is always a way that my teams that I've worked with in the past got behind it. When I used to call it upselling or link selling, they just thought I was being Mr. Mr. Ruthless. But um, yeah, it's just, just adding that little bit of unique add on sale. But if you can increase your average transaction, it's going to help. Build promotional plans. So, planning a retail promotional strategy is essential. Um, you know, you've got to determine why you're doing a promotion and determine what you're going to do. Establish a budget for it. So, it's not all about promotions, it can be very unique, but you need to then build it into your whole year's budget and even planning for purchases and sales. Select the mix. Um, the reason I put that is because there's loads of promotions you can do. You can do price reductions, you can do link sales, you can do bog offs. Um, you know, it's just deciding what is the right promotion for the right product. Implement the promotions professionally. It's easy to do a promotion, but actually make sure the signage is there. There's nothing worse than buying something you do reduced and then forgetting to tell people it's reduced so they don't see it as an offer. Um, but the general stats are. If you put a promotion on the end of an aisle or in a key place, you'll make six times as much turnover as if it was on the shelf. So really try and make your promotions work for you. Um, but then go back and review the success because if something does work, you might want to redo it at a different time. If it doesn't work, you probably don't want to redo it. And service, we can all talk service. Everyone believes they're fantastic at it that on, in most general. Um, I think it's a farm shop industry, we are. We keep our staff. We are very, very personable. We're passionate, passionate knowledgeable. Um, there's a proper commitment from the team. Um, and I do think ongoing training helps and it was touched on in the session previously. But um, I do think from a service point of view, that is a complete USP that will help you commercially. Now, we've got a question is whether you've got enough staff. So Rob commented just at the start of this, that he's got 13% wage to turnover and we're 28% wage to turnover in the cafe. Um, you know, for me, 28% is low. If you can deliver a fantastic service on that, you're doing a great job, but 32 to 34 delivers a fantastic service for a slightly smaller business, I'd say. And, you know, if you're hitting 14 or 15% wage to turnover, don't worry about it too much, but do expect your team to be delivering a really good service. But it does make a difference because you don't get the service in your local high street than you do in a farm shop. Um, and just adding to Malcolm's comment earlier on as well, for those of you that were on it, um, you know, the farm shop is an experience. People don't come to you just to shop. They do in some cases. You know, I've, we've got a farm shop in 
Hertfordshire Way, who uh, is a convenience store, really, um, does a fantastic job, but it's all about convenience. But most farm shops I go to, it's about an experience. You go there and you get blown away by a lot of stuff. Um, you know, I hope they don't mind me talking about it, but my regular haunt is Apley. Now, I didn't know they were an FRA member until earlier this year, but I go there regularly. It's probably a 30 mile drive from where I am now, but I'll drive there because I really enjoy the shop. I enjoy the experience. Um, and I guess I've got the cust they've got the customer loyalty in me as well because I've been going there for a number of years. But the reason I go there is because of their pumpkin event and because of their previous Christmas events and just because the ambience of the place, it is an experience to shop. Um, and you've got to make sure you're inviting and branded. So we talked about branding very quickly earlier on, but it's got to be inviting and clean and tidy. It's just going back to basics. But you do have, if you get your standards right, then you, you, you will bring more customers in. Now the FRA for me are the real drivers of standards for farm shops. There's other associations in different industries, but um, I'm sure other there may be associations within the farm shop that will come and try and hunt me down for saying that. But for me, it's been a very good experience working with the FRA. I think they're really leaders in what they do. Learn from each other on that one. Um, the big thing commercial for the next year for me is make sure your technology is up to date. Anybody not doing click and collect, anybody not doing online shopping, anybody when the cafes reopen not having online ordering, uh, I think you're missing a trick. It's the way the world's gone. Um, COVID has drawn people to just want to turn up, fill their boots and go off. They are mission shoppers. People are coming in, picking up and going. Some of that will hang around even if we do start to see um, the drop off of COVID-19 being an issue over the next year. Fingers crossed we do. Um, but it's been announced or we've been stated that we've had five years worth of IT development in the last five months because of COVID. IT has improved so much that we've got to make sure we're on top of it. And I don't know how you feel your customers are, but I've seen a significant drop in age group of customers and they're a lot more tech savvy. So it's something just to, um, I'd encourage you to look at, if, if you had 20 grand in your pocket, not that you have, but if you had 20 grand in your pocket and you were wondering where to invest it, I wouldn't be looking at certain things, but from an IT development point of view, I think you can really benefit from it if you're, if you're not up to date with it already. So second part I wanted to look at, so that's, that was the biggest one. Second part I wanted to look at was gross margin targets. So just going through these, know your gross margins. I'd like to give you some real stats on gross margins, but each proposition is differently. So those four farm shops I work on, they all work on slightly different gross margins. So, you know, if I just, if I took the catering into account because it's 30% of the business, I've got one catering outlet that's working on 35% wage to turnover. We've got another one who is over the top at 42% and there's another one who's at 28%. So it's knowing your gross margins. When you go into your butchery and your veg and your grocery areas, the product range and how you price point yourself makes a difference. I was at a farm shop um, last month and they changed their retail price depending on their cost price. So they'll, they'll buy up some of their goods in and they change their retail price to hit the gross margin percentage rather than their gross margin percentage move and keep a price continuity for the customer. Um, don't know if I'm in line with that really, but it, it's along the line because I think customers need to understand and not have too much change going on. But it's an interesting concept that they're focused on a total gross margin. Ensure there's targets and budgets in place. For me, that's a given. If you don't know what you're going to take for 2020, if you haven't set budgets for 2021, it's probably something you want to start thinking about. And I know later on we're talking about crystal balls because we don't know how COVID is going to affect us. But you do need targets and you do need budgets because it controls commercially, it controls spend and it sets expectations for turnover and it helps with controlling costs, staffing levels, um, everything really. Communicate targets to the team, because if they don't know, they're not going to be able to deliver them. Know the difference between entry margin and target margin. So very often I'll talk to a business and they'll say to me, my target margin for this product is 40%. And I'll say to them, so how do you work out your price? 
And they say, well, well, we do the equation and it works out at 40%. And I said, well, you know, you might have 2% waste on that. So actually you're gonna hit 38%. And there's a silent pause for a couple of seconds. Now I'm not saying that you all work to that, but it is understanding that if you really want to hit a 40% margin, actually you need to build in your wastage into it. You know, we've got theft, you've got damages, you've just got out of dates. It's, it's just understanding it, what you're gonna do with it. So um, yeah, know your entry and your target margin, sometimes called till margin. Um, build a purchase control process. So with your budgets, um, one of the things that do affect gross margin at the end of the year is overbuying. And actually, if you've got no control methods in place, it can cause a major problem. So I told you earlier on about the 40 million pound business I, I dealt with that was one million pound in debt every year. And the reason being is their way of trying to increase turnover was to buy more and more and more and more and more. And they got left with so much dead stock, it was ridiculous. And the way we controlled it was to introduce a simple system called open to buy. And what it meant was a buyer knew they had 10,000 pounds to spend over a certain period. And every time they bought some it, they minus it off the 10 grand. And then if sales went up, they were able to lift the, lift the purchases. If sales went down, then they actually reduced the purchases. But all of a sudden, the stock control came really in place and it put more pressure on the buyer to buy the right thing. And bless the buyers, you know, they're in a, they're in a horrible job because if they buy well, that's their job. If they buy rubbish, well, they, they big steep comes to them. But it's, um, you know, purchase control processes are important. Uh, have stock management strategies and exit plans in place. So prime one earlier on, I was talking to somebody about poinsettias. Um, you know, come December the 24th, poinsettias stop selling, really. Um, so actually what you need to do is you need to have stock management strategies to get the right amount of poinsettias in and have exit plans to clear them out so it doesn't cause waste or lost profit. Uh, that goes with every single product. Always have a get out, always have a way of thinking about how do I clear this stock out if it's not selling. Build promotional plans just touches on the propositions earlier on and control your waste. One of the biggest issues we have across the industry that I see is waste control. If you've got a cafe, it's a great way of using it, but um, overbuying or not cutting properly, or, you know, there's lots of different ways we can lose waste, but there's, there's gonna be a real review of it. And I was with, um, we did a leadership training course last month and one of the objectives that one of the farm shops took away was to go back and review their wastage from a leadership point of view because they felt that it was out of control. So it was interesting feedback. Um, I'll touch on it later on, but gather and use data as well. Really important that when you're reviewing your gross margins, you're using your EPOS reports. I'm sure there's other data you can use as well, but EPOS reports is essential for monitor theft. Uh, especially alcohol, you know, Christmas is coming and that old bottle of gin disappears. So um, it's putting things in place and even introducing things, you know, there's systems out there, B2B links and other ADT and so on. I don't think they're FRA members and we're trying to encourage them to be so. But um, they monitoring theft and putting processes in place to stop theft does help with gross margin targets. So just going on to the control and purchases and stock levels, as I said, I mean, just touching it again, make sure that they're in the budget. Consider control processes such as open to buy. Uh, one of the things Rob touched on earlier on was his retro, um, but do work with suppliers to receive your best GP. So they will negotiate, they will work with you. Um, yes, sometimes the bigger turnover you've got, the better, the better discount you get, but it's all about relationships and they want every bit of business they can get as well. But don't be afraid to, to argue for that two or 3% GP. Um, you know, I know Fresnelli out there as an ice cream supplier. I don't know how many of you do your own ice creams, but I used to get a 10% retro at the end of the year from them. Um, for years, they never gave us anything. So we didn't move the GP as a buy-in point of view, but we got a retro if we sold over a certain amount. Review your stock turn and slow moving stock from your EPOS reports. If you pull off, I don't know if your suppliers do them, but I used to have an EPOS report that said, stock not sold within three months. So we know when, when meat isn't selling, we know when veg isn't selling, we know when fish and cheese aren't selling because we just consistently turn those around. 
but from a grocery point of view or from a giftware and Christmas point of view, for those of you that do it, if you've got stock that's sat there for a year, it's just rotting. So actually, you've got to review your stock turn on every product. You don't have to review it every week or every day, but you know, just pulling off that report two or three times a quarter, maybe. You know, if you just looked at it every quarter, it would help you clear out some dead stock and free up the cash. Yeah, monitor your data reports, lots of reports. I would encourage all of you to work with your EPOS providers to make sure you're making the most of the reports because how it can affect your margin and your commerciality is essential. Using EPOS data reports effectively, if you do great, if you don't, you might be missing out on one or two percent in your profit. And it doesn't sound a lot when you put it into percentage terms, but if you know your profit line and you think how much of it is 2% of that, if you're not using your data reports profitably, then that could really affect you. And there are FRA members who can help you with that. But before anything else, go to your EPOS provider and see if they can help you with it. Uh, involve your buyers with shop floor teams. So very often when buyers buy things, they have a vision in their head how they're going to sell it. And then they forget to tell the shop floor. So I think the key is that if a buyer, so I use cafetiers, for example, as an example with coffee. So if someone's bought it and they haven't told you that the coffee is to go next to the cafetiers or you're going to put a small selection out, you're going to lose opportunity. So communication is essential. They've got to have the vision to sell a story. So very often things do go in story and Pancake Bay is a good example of putting lots of products together. And stock take at appropriate timescales. I don't know anybody who, uh, most of my clients do work, do do stock takes. Um, you can overdo them. You can completely underdo them. I had one business that was stock taking once a year um, and they were missing a trick completely, especially when it came down to catering margins because they weren't book booking any stock in. So I'd encourage anybody from a, from a reasonable size catering operation, um, if they're not booking stock in regularly, do a stock take once a month. You'll know, you, you'll know your monthly accounts and where your margin is. But when it comes to retail, you need to check your margin. The last thing you want to do is get any surprises at the end of the year and it enables you to take action. So if you've got something regularly being stolen and the person who orders it just tops it up because they think it's selling because they're not quite on top of their game, doing stock takes will highlight that. Um, I, I'd always encourage a good stock take plan and it can be seen by some places as a waste of time. It doesn't have to be done excessively, but you know, my retail areas, I'd probably do a minimum of twice a year um, and catering once a month, but that's just my view. Controlling overheads commercially. Do you know your overhead spend and budget? I talked to many people and I asked them what their electric costs are in the cafes because I know what the answer is going to be. And very often it's mixed in. It's fine if it's mixed in in your business, but just make sure it's, you're keeping your eye on it. Um, but it's the same with water, it's the same with waste control. Every overhead you can think of, know what you spent last year and do cross-reference it. So there you go, use data from previous years. Understand the changes to costs from your budgets. So if you are out against your anticipated budget within one or two months, just know why. I suppose it's unknown loss against known loss. Known loss is good, even though it's loss. Known loss is good, so you can react to it. Unknown loss. You've got to understand it, otherwise it's just going to continue. Build reviews and processes to manage costs and spend. So again, that just goes down to a bit like the open to buy, but just put some processes in place that help you um, monitor what you're spending. And on a monthly basis, you know, you can talk about it and you can review it. And just those things could just save the odd 200 pound there, 500 pound there. Incentivize your teams to find cost savings. So we've done this before. Um, I think somebody saved us £3,000 on electric going back 15 years ago by having sensors that, that turn the lights on when you walked into the bathroom. Now, I appreciate that's in quite a lot of places now, but 15 years ago, it was unheard of. This guy saved us all this money and he got a little reward for it. Um, it was a financial reward at the time. You know, only 20 quid's worth of vouchers but then it invited others to start doing other things, but there's lots of ways of cost savings. You know, it could be people came up with productivity savings and how they could how they could do things quicker. You know, I was working in a garden center at a time and someone showed me how they could save four hours a week cleaning fish tanks. Sounds the most boring thing in the world, but four hours a week, which 
you know, equated to about £30 a week, and you times that by 50, you think how much that is over the cost of the year. Uh, what I would say is don't accept the first quote. So I was talking to somebody who is this week, who's gone to an EPOS provider, and they've been given a quote, and they've gone, yep, yeah, we're going to go with them. And I said, who else have you spoken to? And he said, well, no one. I'm really happy with these guys. Now, it's not an FRA member, I have to say, but um, they're going to spend 70 to 80,000 pounds on an EPOS system. And my honest view is actually you've got two or three other guys you can go out to and you might be able to save yourself 10 or 20 grand with exactly the same service. And if you're not, at least you know that this goes for everything. It's not just about EPOS, it's about um, waste providers. It's about who supplies your milk if you have to buy your milk in. And it's everything, it really is. But from the point of view of the first quote, very often it's down to building works and bigger projects, but don't accept the first quote, challenge it. Now, when it comes to FRA members, benchmark yourself against others really hard. I've talked to a couple of FRA members and businesses aren't like for like, but there are similarities out there. And, and one thing that they're very, very good at is sharing information in a discreet networking way. Um, so, you know, if somebody is down on pumpkins, they've got someone to talk to. If somebody's got a wage to turnover issue or they want to talk to it, they've got somebody to talk to. So do benchmark yourself against others, and that's a real benefit of joining the, member, joining the FRA. So the next thing I want to touch on was running events pro properly. So as I said, I'm a big Apple farm shopper. So um, maybe not as big as they'd want me to be because it's too far away, but I do go there probably six times a year. Um, not a lot. I do have a local farm shop as well. The Apple farm market is a 2018 they run this, uh, and it was really successful for them for all feedback I got. But it... It's, it's knowing why people are running events. So this year, they're not running it for obviously COVID reasons, but it was really, really successful. So they ran it last year as well. Slightly changed it, but they ran it last year. But running events properly is, is essential. And just a few questions to ask yourself when you run an event. Firstly, why are you running the event? What's the theme? So, you know, we know at Halloween what the themes are going to be, but if you're running a random one at summer holidays, why are you doing it and what are you doing it for? What are the additional benefits? Is it to increase footfall? Is it to increase secondary spend? Because for me, secondary spend is the retail and catering side of things when you're talking an event. An event income um, can help. But, you know, what's the reason? Is it just to get people to see you? Um, it's not always a financial return, but what are your additional benefits? What are you getting? What are the audience getting out of it? So Bell's Farm Shop in Stourport, I visited them last weekend. Um, they they ran an outside event in some lovely horrible weather but we still went um ended up buying some local ciders and some cheeses um what did i get out of it i got some gifts from my father-in-law so you know i went there because it was unique it was something different somebody else was doing am i likely to go back to that farm shop yeah because i visited and now i'm feeling part of them uh, have you costed it you know it's a question you should ask yourself how often do you run events? So I've spoke to two farm shops this week about their pumpkin events, and they've both told me they made more profit than last year, despite numbers being significantly different. Do you need help? So the reason I put that in is because we do have in the FRA, we do have people who can help with events, um, both from an advice and from a planning and marketing point of view, but also, um, you know, I, I, I apologize if I miss anybody else, but I know there's people like Merlin and DigiTickets out there who specialize in ticket management. Um, so I apologize if I missed anybody else, but it's it, there are men people out there who can help you with running the event and making the most of it. Um, from an advice point of view, you know, I, I heard a farm shop earlier in the year say that they get 2% of their event turnover comes from hospitality. And it, it, it makes me cry is to run a hospitality um, place for four years and I'd have a minimum return of 20% on catering. So, and that's our external catering away from the cafes. So it, it, it is one of those things that there are people out there who can help. Are you marketing it effectively? Really essential to make sure you get data and stats to see how many people come to you. You know, you used to send flyers out and get a 2% return. Now you can hit a much bigger audience by simply going on Instagram or something. And how are you gonna measure its success? all comes down to how much money comes in and feedback, I guess, um, and how many people turn up, plus how smooth it is to run. 
Commercially managing staff costs and performance, big one for us, huge, huge spend across every farm shop. So financially, you gotta know your cost by role in, in support your proposition. So, you know, how much do you pay a butcher? How much do you pay a chef? I've got two farm shops and uh, one of them, one of them, a chef, literally earns twice as much as the other. Now, it's a different place in the country, but to hear that, you know, chefs are earning twice as much, and I'm not talking little money, you know, we're talking £30,000 and £60,000. There's a lot of difference there, and there's got to be some credibility to what they do for the money. So a lot of this comes down to job description and capability and, and proposition, but um, you've got to know your support. When you talk about butchers, you know, how much are you paying butcher? Have you got a master butcher? Have you just got a general butcher? Are you using um, temps where necessary? Actually, they're quite expensive when you've got somebody who can come in and be part of your team. Are your staff costs budgeted? Again, I know I keep harping on about budgets. It's really important to plan so you're not overspending. And if you are overspending, you can identify it. Do you review costs versus like for like businesses? So that's going against other farm shops, I guess. Do you monitor staff turnover? Um, so staff turnover, why do I mention that commercially? Because it costs a lot of money to bring somebody in, train them up, kit them out with your new uniform, um, and then if they leave again within three months, you've got to do it all again. It's a lot of money. Do you monitor staff sickness? So the reason I put in there is because catering especially, and I'm sorry for picking on that area, sometimes it has high turnover and high sickness, um, and it's really important just to monitor those things to make sure that you're not spending where you don't need to. Um, one of the questions I've got as well, FRA member deputy, um, they supply a return on investment system that enables you to look at your staff rotors and payroll. They think, or they highlight that they can save money on admin time, um, and it costs roughly about three pound a month for an employee. But I'd encourage you all to have a have a chat with them. But at the same token, it's something the FRA do offer because deputy are a big big fan of theirs. If there are others out there, I'm sure we can go through Jenny and highlight it. But um, completing staff rotors and payroll admin, there's a commercial saving there. So it's on their staff turnover and sickness. Have you got review processes in place? So if a member of staff comes back off being sick, are you having a chat with them? Um, and are you identifying how often they're off? And how do you recruit and interview? Do you recruit for skill? Do you recruit for attitude? Do you recruit for a bit of both? Um, very often, you know, people will go with, oh, well, we, we took the best person. I challenge any business to say commercially, is that the right decision? Do you wait for the right person or do you recruit what's best? And, you know, at the moment, it's certainly a buyer's market. I'll put this in here from a staff management point of view. And sorry, looking at the negatives. Um, but anybody who doesn't know the Bradford factor, if you have a high turnover of staff or a high sickness, especially of staff, look at the Bradford factor. Um, because the Bradford factor will identify issues so if you have one member of staff who's had 10 days off in a year but it's just been one time they have one run of 10 days the way the equation works is they'll score 10 which means they're not really a problem but if you've got a member of staff who's had 10 days off and coincidentally it's 10 different occasions your Bradford factor would be a thousand and as soon as you can see by those yellow and orange marks as soon as you start kicking into the 50s you know you've got an issue with commitment to the role uh, not always the case, I've got to say, it sounds a bit harsh, it's not always the case, but it's something to look at. Big one for you, relating to Malcolm, really, um, in his earlier presentation. Do you have specific accountabilities throughout the team? I challenge you all as owners and managers to challenge yourself whether you're doing too much yourself and do your team do things for you. Um, it's just something to think about. The amount of people who did a leadership course and the amount of people who were doing it themselves uh, was surprising um, and it's just that thing of what can you train your team and release to them and make them accountable for sometimes you've got to link that to a job description so they know they're accountable for it and you recruit them for that in the first place do you have a review and appraisal process in place I don't really like the word appraisal but that's how most people identify it it gives you opportunity every six months or every 12 months to talk to somebody about what they want but also what the business needs um, is there development plans in place? It doesn't have to be a written development plan. Uh, you know, I've got a young lady called Lottie that I met two days ago who I got told was an absolute star. 
and I asked the owner what they're doing to develop them to keep them and they went oh I'm not sure and then they're going off to think about it now but it's something that gives people commitment you commit in them they'll commit in you so my big comment here is training and development commercially linking to what Malcolm said earlier on commercially this will make you the most money you invest in staff and give them the experience and the skill and the knowledge to do their job, you will reap the rewards commercially. Uh, unfortunately, we can't give you any stats on it. But I think the key is we all know we keep people and we train them to do a good job. They will make us more money. Now, Malcolm earlier on touched on leadership styles, which is really interesting because um, if you didn't listen to his session, go back because he's going to go, he went through it in a lot more detail than I will. But from a leadership style point of view, there's four styles. The first one's directing. So if you're telling people what to do commercially, your time is being used an awful lot. If you coach them, you've limited a bit more of your time, but you're still spending an awful lot of your own time coaching and doing the on-floor jobs. It's a really important part of coaching. It's probably the most biggest, it's the biggest box that gets people sitting in the farm shops, but it's one of those things that really you want to move on to supporting. So, you know, a core, a core team, a real backbone of your team can do the job without being told, and you're there just to help them. And then delegating, actually, you don't even need to be there. They just get on with it. Now, you can't abdicate the job because that's wrong. Commercially, people may wonder why this is in here, but the key for me is, if you get through to supporting and delegating, you are going to have so much more time to think about what will make you the big money. So instead of thinking about telling somebody to price a good that's going to make you, you know, a little bit money here and there, you're going to be talking about strategies. You're going to be talking about what's going to put an extra £300,000 through the till in the next year. Uh, effective marketing from a marketing mix point of view. I think the key one here is to plan your promotion. So, um, you know, we've talked about it earlier on, choose the right product, get it at the right price. It doesn't have to be cheap. It just has to be the right price because the product might be the sell, the sale point. Um, decide what promotion you're going to run. I said, is it a bog off? Is it a, um, a reduction? Is it just a new in, buy it now? When it's gone, it's gone. Um, and then put it in the right place. As I said, you can sell six times more off an end than you will or off a hotspot. And I'd suggest that any reasonable farm shop has a number of hotspots separate to their core retail. That you will just be surprised how much money. I used to turn over £9,000 per hotspot from four hotspots in a 30 square metre unit with my food hall. Uh, £9,000 per hotspot. So that's, you, know, you look at that, it's 36 k for something that the previous year we weren't putting promotions out. So marketing, social media, there's around 44, 45 million Facebook users in the UK. Uh, biggest age group is 25 to 34, as we can guess. Um, so this was all 2019 stats. Um, we've seen a younger market coming in, maybe not 34 year olds, mainly probably around 40, but we've seen a younger market this year. And if you have a look at these stats, this just helps marketing from social networks, Facebook, this last year was still the highest used social media. YouTube randomly was really high. Um, still catches me by surprise that because I don't use YouTube, but I'm a bit of an old dinosaur at times. Um, WhatsApp, if you've got a WhatsApp group, especially a community group, it works, um, and Messenger. But Instagram and Facebook, they're the two that really jump out for me. They really, really are. Even though Instagram's further down that line, they really are the way to market to our audience. You just think I call it Heart FM customer, which is the 40 year old lady, she influences a lot, but they do use that more for a uh, Just touching very quickly on customer loyalty programs as well. COVID has created a community spirit. And if you can introduce a customer loyalty program, however you set it up, it's, it will work for you. It creates customer retention. It, gets them to shop more. You put a card in somebody's pocket, they will shop more with you. Um, it gives you an insight and it increases revenue, gives you an insight to what the customer wants. Data analysis, sorry, I'm gonna crack on through this because it's time to move on. Data analysis, um, EPOS data does give you facts. You've got to talk to your EPOS provider, they'll give you all this, it identifies sales and profit opportunities, highlights issues with stock, 
and gross margin effects. It supports future planning decisions. The more data you've got, the more facts you've got to plan for the future. And it can save labor costs, especially in accounts and admin, because it could be productivity, it could be the amount of ordering, it could be um, dealing with invoices you don't need to. Does anybody deal with KPIs and targets? It's something I always ask myself. So I'm just gonna highlight these up. These are different KPIs that businesses can set their targets on. Conversion rate, sales per square meter, uh, gross profit margins, average transaction values, year-on-year -year growth, wastage and shrinkage, footfall, uh, how long shoppers stay with you, which during COVID time isn't a good thing, but it might be something for after. Staff costs and staff turnover. Um, from the point of view of all of these KPIs, there are others you can do as well that you need to set yourself probably four or five key performance indicators that you can review on an ongoing basis to say, are we hitting what we want to hit? And anybody wants to talk about that in more detail, you know, you'd be able to get my details and we can go through them. Um, future business development and planning, like the crystal ball, COVID's affected an awful lot. I think the big thing for me is to ask questions of yourself going forward. Are you on top of the trends? Now that could be COVID, it could be fashion. Uh, you know, when I say fashion, I mean what's trendy to eat. Um, what are your competitors doing? Are you reacting to it? What are other like for like businesses doing? So again, this is where the FRA comes in. You can you can phone people and you can find out what they're doing. Do you need to update your business model and plan? Um, is it got stale? Does it need reviewing? Is there an opportunity to grow your business? or just stabilize it. What obstructions are there that stop you from developing your business or your team or moving forward? What help do you need? Uh, and there's plenty of help out there. And I guess if you're gonna set objectives going forward from a commercial aspect, make sure they're achievable, agree the objectives with the team so they're involved. And the big thing is to understand the data so that commercially you're making the decision for the right reason. The last slide I've got really is the Farm Retail Association. They can help. Um, I appreciate I haven't gone into stats during this presentation. There was too much detail, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, you know, one of those subjects can take an hour. It doesn't mean we're not going to do them. Part of the FRA thing that Jenny and myself have talked about is potentially breaking these down into sessions for the future. So our FRA members can really benefit from some real specifics. This was just a touch on the sort of things we look at. But um, my view of joining the FRA this year for the first time, I've been involved in farm shops for a lot. They're really worthwhile talking to and finding out whether it benefits for the cost. Jenny, up to you really. Any questions? Thank you very much indeed for that, um, Andrew. That was brilliant. There's been some great um, chats going on along the side here as well. Um, if anybody has got any questions at the moment, then please do chip in on the chat panel and uh, I'm sure that Andrew and myself and Rob would be more than happy to, to answer them. Um, just have a quick look through. So um, John said, uh, powerful measure, all the team in a farm shop can work to increase in the average transaction value. Judy from Right Product, Right Place, saying that um, hotspots can need a fresh pair of eyes. So if you did want a, a hand with that, then absolutely Judy is the woman to have a chat with. Um, Helen here saying click and collect just hasn't worked for us. When I've spoken to customers, they seem to want to come to the shop instead as they feel safe in my shop and want to get out. I've advertised this in store on Facebook and Instagram. I'm not sure how to make click and collect take off. I'm not on trend. Andrew, any thoughts on that? I'm not sure if it's because uh, Helen's not on trend. What, what do you think? No, I think, um, I mean, my first view is I'm looking at it with a smile, thinking, well done, Helen, because if people feel safe in your shop and they want to get to you, great. If you can get them in the shop, you're going to sell more. So I think that's really good. I do think there's an audience out there, though, that really need or really want that click and collect option. And it's whether you've got the facilities and the setup that support. Um, I don't want to deflect, deflect this to other any, any FRA members, but, you know, there are FRA members where it's working really well for it. And, um, you know, our chairman is one of them, and he might have a view on click and collect as much as myself. But I think it's great that people do want to come in your shop, but I do think there's an opportunity there, and I think it'll happen more and more through 2021. So it might be something to keep your eye on rather than take a big jump, because it'll only work if you want it to work. 
Thank you. I think Helen just actually replied saying my savings are triple this year than last, so just stick with the shop potentially. So that's brilliant, Helen. Um, yeah. Um, Luke Fletcher from Digi Tickets, happy to help and chat through with anyone who is considering moving some areas of the farm shop online. Click and collect is something we can help with. So I'll share Luke's um, contact details in the follow up um, email. We've got plenty of amazing supplier members that uh, are always on hand to offer um, support and advice. We've got Mark Ellis from Appetite, B, Appetite Me on this call. We've got a number of uh, fantastic suppliers that we work with that we can absolutely point people in the direction of. Um, Judy might be worth advertising on the roadside to catch them on the way to the supermarket. Bit of guerrilla marketing there. Um, but yeah, thank you, Andrew. Brilliant, brilliant topic. Um, really appreciate you taking the time. Lots of food for thought. And as Andrew says, there's plenty of topics there that as an association, I'm sure we'll be able to delve in a little bit further on if there's any areas that particularly caught your attention. Do, do let us know and we can look into that. Uh, Rob, anything to add? Oh, just really good talk, Andrew. Really good. Uh... I'll give you my takeaways quickly what I've got. Uh, November will be huge. I really hope you're right. I feel you're right. And, uh, you know, there are only three ways to increase turnover. More customers, increase the average sale or increase the frequency of selling to them. I've never found a fault yet. Uh, keep it fresh, the people, the place, the products and the promotions. You said you can't standardise a farm shop, but through the FRA, you can meet businesses similar to yourself and get a little networking group going. That works really well for me. Yeah. Uh, know your numbers. I think that's the number one tip you can. We really do need to know his numbers. Uh, you questioned what are we famous for? That question got me, actually. I don't know whether it's pumpkins, pies, or days out. I need to work on that. I think it probably changes seasonally. Uh, what's my target market? Is this changing at the moment? Does it change seasonally? Has it changed with COVID? You sort of created some questions for me there. Shopping trolleys, people shop by way, keep them clean, keep them maintained. You put some pictures of merchandise and displays up. You need to change them and speak to Judy. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I need to work on cross sell up, sell, link sell across all departments this November, December. Don't forget signage, it's the hardest bit. Uh, build a purchase control process. I haven't got one. I can't believe that, but I haven't got a purchase control process on the setters, get them in. Instagram has taken a step change this year in my business. I've never seen so many people coming for the Instagram shots. It's really, really noticeable. They're getting all dressed up and they're coming for that perfect photo. So in, we're spending a lot of money on photo opportunities now, and that's really working for us. Uh, involve buyers with the team. People deal with people, so give the team the story and introduce them to the buyer. And a big question, am I on top of the trends? That's what I've taken from you today, Andrew. So well done and thank you. Yeah, I guess I've got to just, um, you know, if, if it wasn't enough specific detail for everyone, it's just sort of manage that expectation that we, we're trying to touch on the headlines for everyone. We can give a little, you know, the FRA, we've got so many contacts and if you're in the FRA, don't be afraid to talk to each other, including suppliers and everyone. I mean, we're all here to help each other, aren't we? So. There's a lot more detail we can go in. And I know talking to Jenny, we, you know, we'll have some sessions lined up in the new year and early part of next year where that we can we can break down a lot more of this in detail for you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, for those of you that aren't currently members of the Farm Retail Association, we'd love to welcome you on board. And I will send a follow-up email so that you've got my contact details. You already have, but at least you've got a face to the name now. Um, do feel free to get in touch and... Uh, for, for everybody else, thank you very much for, for being a continued supporter of ours and uh, for being part of the association. And uh, we'll sign off there. But thank you very much for your time, everyone. Thanks thank so you. Much. Cheers, Andrew. Cheers.